From the newsrooms of the City Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. It's Wednesday, June 7. They could wipe 20 years off average life expectancy and possibly return modern medicine to a pre-antibiotic era. We're talking about superbugs, those organisms that have evolved to become resistant to modern medicine. They can cripple us or kill us. Right now, millions of people around the world are battling one. The United Nations estimates that by 2050, 10 million people will die every year from superbugs. Today, senior reporter Henrietta Cook on the rise of superbugs are what one expert calls the biggest public health threats of our age. So Henrietta, just to start, can you explain to us what exactly superbugs are? Superbugs are bacteria, viruses, fungi that have evolved to become resistant to the drugs that we commonly use to kill them. So things like antibiotics and antifungals. We're all at risk of catching a superbug, but people who take antibiotics frequently or for a long period of time are at much higher risk. People who have been exposed to them in hospitals or have a weakened immune system are also in danger. Many people don't even know they're carrying them um, and they're often harmless, but they can lead to a serious infection if they enter a person's bloodstream through something like a cut, a surgical wound or a catheter, and they can lead to serious infection and even death. I mean, that's quite shocking. And you've written quite a large piece about this. Is it true that one expert told you that there's even concerns that the sort of rise of superbugs could send us back to a pre-antibiotic era? That's what some experts warn, which sounds really terrifying. But if we can't use the drugs that we have previously used to kill infections, then that is a possible reality. And so let's just step back, I mean, to the pre-antibiotic era. What did that look like? It was quite scary. Before the arrival of antibiotics, things like an infected pimple or a scratch or even a shaving cut could kill you. Diseases that we treat today, things like pneumonia, tuberculosis and whooping cough were often a death sentence. I read some shocking stat that one in 20 children died before their first birthday and the discovery of penicillin changed all this. In 1928, British scientist Alexander Fleming returned to his lab after a holiday and found that this mould called Penicillum notatum had thrived in these petri dishes that were dotted with the Staphylococcus bacteria. That some mould, such as appears on decaying food, had begun to grow. A spoiled experiment. It looked like the mould was creating this substance that was wiping out the bacteria around it. He looked closer. He saw that near to the mould, No germs were growing. Might it be that this mould, like the human body, produced a substance capable of destroying germs? But it took quite a long time before this was actually picked up and turned into a drug. Fleming published what he had done, calling his substance penicillin. With the help of Australian scientist Howard Florey, it was used to fight infection during World War II. Huge numbers of soldiers in World War I had died from relatively minor cuts that had become infected. Britain's output joined the huge supplies now coming from the United States to give life to hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Antibiotics were a real game changer. They added 20 years to our average life expectancy, so the average person lived to 70 instead of 50. When I was researching this, I also found out that my uncle Tony died from pneumonia in a country hospital in Victoria when he was eight months old. Penicillin just wasn't widely available then, but yeah, if it had been, he'd he'd still be here today. Right. And the majority of Australians wouldn't even know a life without antibiotics. And yet now we've got this rise of superbugs that we're being told is such a huge threat to us. So what are the main reasons why superbugs are emerging as such a threat? Bacteria evolve at lightning speeds because they multiply so quickly. So only those with the best defences against pressures, such as a course of antibiotics, will survive. We can't stop this happening, but we can slow it down. 
There's also an issue where big pharma aren't creating enough drugs to overcome and stop the spread of superbugs. Antibiotic overuse is also a big issue here. We've all shown up to a GP clinic before with a sore throat or an earache and asked for antibiotics or we've been prescribed them. But they're often being prescribed in situations where they're completely useless, such as when we've got a virus and it's this overuse that's fueling the spread of superbugs. Apparently some of the experts I spoke to said we're some of the highest users of antibiotics on a per capita basis. I think 26 million prescriptions were dispensed in Australia in 2019, which equates to about one per person. And they say that about half of those antibiotics were unnecessary. I mean, that's fascinating. So let's let's go through those points. So the abuse of antibiotics, how is that part of the, the rise of superbugs? So what happens is when you take a course of antibiotics, the good bacteria in your gut also takes a beating with the bad bacteria. And they say that that can create what's known as a bacterial vacuum. So it allows resistant bacteria to get in. But of course, we shouldn't really worry about that when we actually do need antibiotics to get better. That should be a secondary consideration. The other thing that can happen is the longer and the more frequently you take antibiotics, the more likely your bugs will become resistant because they'll produce more mutations in an attempt to outsmart the antibiotics. So why are doctors giving out prescriptions for antibiotics when they're not needed? I mean, what's happening in there and how did we get to that point where we're overprescribing so many antibiotics, particularly in Australia? A lot of doctors say that they're facing pressure from patients to give out scripts for antibiotics. Patients have gone to the effort of making an appointment with a GP and we often want a magical pill or potion that will make us better again. So we ask for something like an antibiotic when it's not actually necessary, particularly when we've got something that's caused by a virus. There's this other thing that's known as diagnostic uncertainty. So doctors don't know whether a patient with a cold is actually experiencing the early stages of a much more serious condition, such as something like pneumonia or meningitis, which does need a course of antibiotics. So they hand out a script just in case. I mean, that's fascinating. You've also mentioned that drug companies are not developing new effective treatments to to fight superbugs, and that's led to this emergence. So why is that? It's because there's not much profit in creating drugs that are only needed by a small proportion of patients who are harbouring these superbugs. Traditionally, I guess, big pharma develops drugs that are going to be bought by heaps of people so they can make lots of money. But there isn't a huge opportunity here because without government support, this sort of flips their traditional business model on the, on its head. You wouldn't want to use these new antibiotics on everyone because the more they use, the more quickly they lose their potency because the bacteria will develop the ability to survive. So you'd only use them for patients whose infections don't respond to existing antibiotics. I mean, this is fascinating to me because you've written that the United Nations estimates that by 2050, 10 million people are going to die from a superbug every year. So why wouldn't Big Pharma see this as a huge opportunity? I mean, if superbugs are such a big threat, is it possible that the danger that superbugs pose is being sort of overblown? I don't think it's being overblown. I just don't think that the drug companies will want to do this without government support. So overseas, uh, particularly in the UK, they call it the Netflix model for antibiotics. So government's actually funding drug companies to develop and just reserve the use of these drugs for when they need it because they obviously don't want to sell heaps of these drugs because it will reduce the potency of them. I don't think the threat of superbugs is being overhyped. All the experts I spoke to were very concerned about what our future might look like and it's not something that's intangible. I think last year there were a 1,000 Australians who died from superbug infections. But some people I spoke to think that when push comes to shove, we will develop new antibiotics which will help us overcome these superbugs and perhaps the future is not as dire as some believe. Right, okay. And if the current antibiotics that we have now don't work to fight the superbugs, how are we treating people now? Or is there nothing we can do at the moment? So at the moment, if you don't respond to one of the commonly used antibiotics, which are known as first-line antibiotics, you're given second or third-line antibiotics. These are stronger 
uh, but they also carry more side effects and they can cause organ damage, particularly to kidneys and liver. And they're often administered in hospitals intravenously and can, you know, add a add a lot of um, extra cost to someone's treatment. I think about ten thousand dollars. The other option, uh, which was something that Cassie Anderson, the woman who I interviewed in my piece, spoke about, is something called phage therapy. It was pioneered more than a century ago, and it basically uses harmless viruses to kill germs where antibiotics have, have failed. So this woman I spoke to, Cassie, who has a superbug in her lungs, is getting a bacteria-eating virus made for her in the US at the moment and she's hoping to soon infect her lungs with it once it passes all levels of government and biosecurity and makes its way to Australia. But my understanding from your piece is that she's sort of in limbo at the moment. She's concerned because that phage therapy hasn't come through yet. It's quite difficult to get viruses brought into the country. So what does her life look like now as she is battling this superbug and waiting for this treatment? Yeah, it's had an awful impact on her life. She receives daily medical treatment from a nurse who comes to her apartment in Sydney and hooks a catheter in her arm to a bottle of antibiotics, which go into her bloodstream 24 hours a day. She also takes antibiotics orally and they have caused hearing loss and tinnitus and they don't actually cure her condition in her lungs. So she continues to cough. She can't do many of the things she used to do. There are some things I can't do. I do have a very severe cough. So I love yoga, for instance. Mm. I can't do yoga now because down dog and up dog just ends up in a coughing fit. I love walking, but I can't walk and talk anymore. You know? Yeah. And she also can't really leave Sydney and all her family are in Victoria because she's so reliant on this team of medical experts who are basically keeping her alive. So what impact has that had on her, I think, emotionally in addition to physically? Because, like you said, she's actually been prohibited because of the treatment she needs from visiting her own children. Yeah, I think it's been really tough on her. Um, Look, she has managed to hold down a job and has a very supportive family but um yeah it was just this fluke thing that happened to her and yeah she's not sure why she caught the bug she thinks she might have got it from potting mix or maybe even through her shower head because the particular superbug she's got is spread by water or air i do have a pretty good attitude towards it mm. i can't feel like everyone just you need to just deal with what you have yeah see the brightness Mm. of it Mm -hmm. Um, so I do get up and do as much as I can still there are some things I can't do thank you so much Henrietta for joining us no problem thanks so much today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carr Katzel our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.